my friend Danielle is going to read the passage. The passage is Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. So go ahead. The Little Children and Jesus People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed them, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Thank you, Danielle. Can we thank her for reading? It's a good job. Well done. She'll be giving the sermon next week, so you can look forward to that. So we are back into a, gos- a series on the Gospel of Mark called Amazing Grace. We started it in the spring. We took a break over the summer, and now we're back into it. And this morning, the, this passage that was read, I'd have to say, is might be one of my favorite passages in all the Bible, which sounds strange because it doesn't seem like there's really deep uh, teaching there. It's not a miracle. It seems a little simple, but I think as we get into it, you'll see why. So to set the context, Jesus is in the middle of some extensive teaching. If you look back at Mark chapter 9 up until our passage, there's this lengthy teaching going on. He He's taught about his coming death. He's taught about who his true followers are, who his true disciples are. He's talked about the dangers of sin. He's talked about how to enter the kingdom. And he's taught about divorce. And then in the middle of this extended time of teaching, it almost appears that this happens as he is teaching. We read, people were bringing little children to him. So as he's teaching, there appears to be this interruption of parents bringing their children to him. And what we're going to see in this passage is three things. Bring the children, get rid of the children, and become like children. So let's start with this bring the children. So people are bringing their children for Jesus to place their hands on them. They're seeking a blessing for their children. Because there was this belief at the time that rabbis, that holy men, could confer blessing upon others by placing hands on them. Or even if you touch the clothing of a rabbi, you might be able to get a blessing. So these parents, they want Jesus to bless their children, which is a good thing. And it's something we want to do, those of us who are parents. In order for our children to be blessed, we do different kinds of things. We care for their physical needs. We provide food and clothing and shelter. We provide for their education. We provide for their emotional care. We provide for their spiritual care. We bring them to church. So we have this desire that our children be blessed by God. So the parents sense that for the well-being of their children, despite all the physical needs they can provide, there's this deeper need of a blessing from Jesus. And it's a great example for all of us parents to take a hold of, that we can do what these parents did. We can bring our children to Jesus and ask Jesus to bless them. So I want to challenge all the parents in this room, even if you have adult children, make a commitment to bring your children to Jesus every day. And what I mean by that is to pray for your children. Pray that God will bless your children, that God will protect your children, that God will provide for your children. Lamentations 2.19 says, Arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children. God loves 
your children. God desires for them to fulfill his calling on their lives. And just as these parents did, we need to humble ourselves and say, God, I need help. I need divine strength and protection. I can't do this on my own. I love the fact that as a church, we celebrate. We just, we just showed three beautiful pictures of, of be, three beautiful newborns. And then we also have this practice of child dedication where, where parents come on this stage holding their, uh, their newborn or their children in a very important and public confession saying, we choose to raise our children in the fear of the Lord. And, and as I thought about that, I thought that is a great model just to continue. That can be the start of a perpetual dedicating of your children to God, to use that initial action of child dedication as a model for how you will pray for your child for the rest of their life. As I was thinking about how to pray for children, I think one of the most important ways we can pray for our children is that they would be grounded in the love of God. Because children and teenagers are forming their identity. And as they form their identity, there can be times of insecurity and times of anxiety and times of fear. But if they are rooted deeply in God's love for them, and if they can see themselves as God sees them, they're better able to handle some of those challenges. Because we have an enemy. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And one of the tools of the enemy is to speak lies to us, to tell us that we are not worthy enough, that we are not good enough, that we are not smart enough, that we are not pretty enough. And we need to pray against those lies that can infect the minds of young people and cause great damage. Pray that your children abide in the love of God. Help them to hear your love for them to feel your love for them, to believe in your love for them. Pray that your home would be a home filled with the love of God, that your children are secure, that your love for them and your acceptance of them is not based on their performance, is not based on anything they need to earn. You just love them because you love them. Another way you can bring your children to Jesus is to create structures in your home where there are no barriers between Jesus and your family. Things like managing screen time, things like managing even good things like athletics or the arts in such a way that you don't schedule out the priority of church and of church attendance. You can bring your children to Jesus by reading scripture with them and over them. Because every child needs to feel loved, secure, and safe. And parents need to call on God's resources to be able to provide for their children. So the first point is is simply that, bring the children to Jesus. But this action of bringing the children to Jesus leads to an interesting reaction from the disciples. And this is the second point, get rid of the children. Because in verse 13, we read, the disciples rebuked them. The parents are bringing their children to Jesus, and the, the disciples get angry and rebuke them. The disciples are telling the p- parents, what you're doing is wrong, and try to correct them, which is sounds weird to us, right? Because in our church, we celebrate children. As I, We just showed these beautiful pictures of the newborns, and we do child dedication, and we we put resources into kids' zone, into, into providing for our children. So what's going on with these disciples that they would get angry at parents for bringing children to Jesus? We need to understand the value of children at that time. In the Greco-Roman world, children were not of any value. Children were of little value until they were old enough to be able to contribute to the economy of the family. They were just sort of tolerated. Parents were basically just waiting for the kids to grow up, and it was then that they would have value. That's why we have repeated injunctions in the Old Testament to care for the alien, the widow, and the orphan, 
because those are all categories of human beings that have no agency, power, or validity in the surrounding culture. They were seen as expendable. And in the same way, children were seen as of no value. Now, I'm going to share something with you that will be hard for you to believe, but this is, this is a true fact. You can do your own research. In first century Rome, there was an act that some parents did called exposition or exposure. Exposure was the action of taking your child and leaving your child by the side of the road. There were designated spots you could leave your children, and you were exposing them to the elements and the wild animals. You were It was simply abandoning children. If a family had too many children and they couldn't afford to take care of another child, they would take that newborn child to a designated spot. Sometimes they would put amulets or jewelry on them with the belief that that could help the child in their next life. Most of the children would die from starvation or dehydration. Some of them would be picked up and adopted. Other children, in the first example of human trafficking, would be taken over by criminal enterprises and conscripted into uh, armies or uh, some of the girls would be trafficked into prostitution. There were very few cultures in history who had had such a low perception of the value of children. And so you can see the disciples of this reaction of get these kids out of here. These, These children are of no value. They're of no importance to us. Besides, can't you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus is teaching. Jesus is preaching. Jesus is delivering demons. Jesus is healing people. These kids are in the way. Let's go to the third point. Become like children. In verse 14, we see how Jesus reacts. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. The Greek word is agonateo, and it's an idea of being angry at an injustice to the point where you're almost shaking. You're so upset. Jesus is so upset when he sees the actions of this disciples. And so you kind of have this highly charged emotional scene here. The disciples are, the disciples are mad at the parents, and now Jesus is mad at the disciples. And I'm sure there was like kind of this tension in the air. And if you walked in there, you'd be like, oh, something just went down. But Jesus now explains why he's angry. He says, let them come to me. Let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. And why do I want these children? Why do I want these children that are not valued to others? It's because the kingdom belongs to them. Because to enter my kingdom, you have to come in as a child. Jesus wants the children. Don't hinder them. Don't put any barrier between me and children. And Jesus wants the children because the kingdom of God belongs to them. And I can almost guarantee that the disciples' heads blew up when he said that because the disciples knew what kingdom was. Kingdom was not these children. Kingdom was Rome. Kingdom was power. Kingdom was the military. In the minds of the disciples, there was still this belief that Jesus was this emerging military political leader who was going to overthrow Rome and usher in a Jewish renaissance. And there was no way that these children were going to fit into that plan. The disciples had an image of an earthly kingdom, not uh, uh, not a godly kingdom. They had a kingdom whose metrics are measured by power and strength. But Jesus, the revolutionary, describes a whole different kind of kingdom. In fact, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And Jesus will flesh this out in the rest of our passage. And this is actually the second reason they didn't want the kids around, because they were in the way of building Jesus' kingdom. And then Jesus drops another truth truth bomb. He says, truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And I I got the feeling like Jesus really got in the face of the disciples. Just like, look, you don't know what you're doing. You guys are not helping by keeping the children away. We need the children. And I would have loved to hear how the disciples responded. I'm sure they were like, 
I, do you like, look at what we've done. We've given up everything to follow you. We're with you, Jesus. And we're like big, strong men. It should be the opposite. You should be telling the kids that no one enters the kingdom unless you're like us, unless you're like the disciples. And yet you're putting us down and lifting these kids up. This makes no sense. And here we enter the ter- topsy-turvy, upside-down ethics and metrics of Jesus. And in the end, the ethics of Jesus wins over the ethics of this world and the ethics of the disciples. The disciples wanted to build a kingdom of political power and military might, and Jesus wanted to build a kingdom out of children and out of infants and out of those who the world rejects. You see, the ethic of love for children came through for Jesus— As we look back on history, we see that starting in the first century, it was the Christians who came to the aid of the abandoned children. Remember what I said about the exposure of infants that took place? It was actually Christianity that reversed that horrible practice. Tom Holland in his book Dominion writes this, Lepers and slaves were not the most defenseless of God's children. Across the Roman world, wailing at the sides of roads or on rubbish tips, babies abandoned by their parents were a common sight. Others might be dropped down drains there to perish in the hundreds. Few had ever queried this practice. Only a few peoples had stood aloof from the exposure of unwanted children. Pretty much everyone else had always taken it for granted, until that was the emergence of a Christian people." Pretty much everyone else had always taken it for granted until that was the emergence of a Christian people. Until the emergence of a Christian people. Until the emergence of men and women so transformed by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, this man himself who was born in suspicious circumstances. He himself who could have been abandoned as a child. This man who embraced the children and brought dignity to children, it was Jesus who changed people, and those people changed society. I hope you see how hope-filled this is. Because there are a lot of practices, there are a lot of activities in our culture that people simply take for granted as the way things should be. But the way things are now are not as they ought to be, nor as they should be, and they can change. Because our culture is discipling and catechizing us into anti-Christian ways of thinking. But everyone took it for granted until the emergence of the Christians. Because it was the Christians who went to those abandoned sites and they picked up the children and they loved them and they took them into their homes and they raised them. And that one action, it wasn't legislative, it wasn't political, it was actions of love and service and self-sacrifice that completely reversed that practice in that culture. We are in need of a church in which all children are valued because we live in a culture where not All children are valued. We live in a culture where talks of rights and the autonomy of the human body trumps the biological reality of a living being in a womb. Abortion is the modern equivalent of the practice of exposure in the first century. Thank God for the Saskatoon Pregnancy Option Center that provides a space, safe space for women to go and discuss the options available to them. Thank God for churches and ministries that do not abandon women in crisis, but instead walk and resource them in their time of need. Thank God for ministries that walk alongside vulnerable children and care for them, value them, and love them in Jesus' name. And it started with the church. It started with Jesus caring and loving for children. And the church saw that, and the church said, children are valuable, and we are not going to abandon the children that our culture wants to throw away. It's so amazing. I hope you're starting to see why I love this story so much. It's just so amazing because you have the disciples pushing the kids and the parents away and Jesus saying, bring those kids here. Bring them here. 
And there must have been this tense silence as Jesus rebukes the disciples and people are like, what's he going to say? He's gotten angry at the disciples and he says, let them come to me. Don't hinder them. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Then he says, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then Jesus, what does he do? He embraces and he blesses the children. And when he does that, he reveals something about humanity. He reveals the deepest need of human beings. The deepest need of the human heart is to be fully known and to be fully loved. What I mean by that is is we all have a desire that someone knows us really, really well and still loves us really, really well. Jesus takes the children in his arms, places his hands on them, and blesses them. That is the desire of every human being on the planet. That is the desire of every single one of you in this room. That is the desire of every one of you watching online. At the core of your being is this deep, primal desire to have your Heavenly Father take you in his arms, place his hands on you, and bless you. And then the question is, how do we get that? How do we get what we really need that we need so much? Well, how do we get that? You have to become like a little child. Remember what Jesus said, you'll never, you'll never enter my kingdom unless you enter it as a child. How do we enter the kingdom as children? Children are dependent. Newborn babies are completely dependent for everything. Food, changing, sleeping. They're at the complete and total mercy of the caregivers around them. To enter the kingdom as a child is to enter in dependency on Christ. It is to enter with a feeling of helplessness. To enter the kingdom as a child is to realize that Jesus paid it all. To enter the kingdom as a child is to rely completely on what he has done and not on your own merit. Complete and total reliance. In the hymn Rock of Ages, there's these lines, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Another reason why this is such a powerful reality of Jesus embracing children is because some of us may never have felt embraced as children. Some of us may never have had homes where we were loved. Um, I'm reading a book on ethics right now, and and in the middle of the book, the, the author, who's a pastor, shares this touching story about how when he was growing up, he never heard his father say, I love you. If he got a 95 on a test, his father would say, why didn't you get a 98? His father's desire with that was, was that he would go into the academics and become a chemistry professor because he had been studying chemistry in university. But instead, he became a pastor And he always had this nagging sense of inferiority. And he struggled with depression and this deep desire to sense his father's love and approval of him. Then he describes an incident where God's love broke through on him. He writes, One incident serves to illustrate one of the mysterious and undeserved experiences of the love of God. My wife was ill and bedridden. We had two young children. All day I'd battled the Monday blues that often assail preachers on top of my more generalized depression. I didn't read the Bible with the kids that morning. I didn't pray with them. I was too busy getting them off to school. I did all the housework. I made dinner. I got the washing on. I put the kids to bed. And then I had to go out and get some groceries. And I was really angry. Every traffic light was red. The line for the grossly clerk was long, the people were dumb, and she was really slow. Swear words filled my consciousness. Can you believe this? Like, they, this is a pastor. Swear words filled my consciousness. I've never, well, if I did, I wouldn't admit it, that swear words filled my consciousness. 
He gets in his car and some worship music comes on. And he's like, you got to be kidding me. At the end of my day, are you kidding? Are you joking with me, God? But he keeps the music on and he hears these lines. Loved with everlasting love. Led by grace that love to know. Spirit breathing from above. You have taught me it is so. Oh, this full and perfect peace. Oh, this transport all divine. In a love which cannot cease. I am his and he is mine. His forever, only his. Loved with everlasting love. And a powerful, overwhelming sense of the love of God came over him. And he cried for the first time as an adult. In his words, I was overwhelmed by a gracious outpouring of the Father's love, and I had a profound sense of his voice saying, and I want you to hear this, through all you went through as a child, I was always there with you. Through all you went through as a child, I was always there with you. And that's a beautiful thing, but the, the, the crowning moment of this is that was on a day when he least deserved to hear those words because he was angry, he was bitter, he was resentful. And yet God in his gracious mercy overwhelmed that man and gave him a taste of his love. I'll invite Reuben up for our closing song. So the summary of this is this. Parents, bring your children for Jesus to bless them because Jesus is building his kingdom through them. And finally, enter his kingdom like a child. Allow Jesus to touch those broken parts in you that you carry from childhood. And then when we do bring those things to Jesus, Jesus puts his arms around us. He places his hands on us and he blesses us and he says, welcome home. May you feel the warm embrace of the Father's arms around you. May you feel his deep love at the depths of your soul. May you hear him call you his blessing. God loves you. Now go and love a world that needs to feel his love through you. Amen.